Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the Graduate Student Online Seminar, uh, summer 2021. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say a couple of quick things. Uh, despite the, the words graduate student being in the title, uh, attendance is open to pretty much everyone, and people's backgrounds can vary a lot. So I'd just like to ask people to sort of be respectful of your friends and colleagues um, here during the seminar. That being said, um, please do feel free to ask questions. The primary goal of, of these kinds of seminars is for it to be a sort of nice positive learning experience for everyone involved and asking questions definitely helps. Um, in the spirit of sort of a usual in-person seminar, um, it's perhaps easiest uh, if you do have a question or you would like a clarification or anything like that, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and politely interrupt. Um, you can also post your questions in chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it and I can relay any questions um, to the speaker. Um, and then we will also leave a little bit of time at the end if you have maybe like a longer question or like a more involved or detailed explanation, um, we'll have a little bit of time for that. Um, right, okay, so with, with that being said, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dan Summers, who will be talking to us about uh, the RSK-Y proposition. So turn it over to you. All right, so uh, just thank you for the, the invitation to talk at, uh, at the seminar. Um, clearly, uh, my date <laughs> is wrong on my title page. Um, I'll admit to not being able to find the tech file this morning. Um, so I'm just, here's a PDF of the same talk I gave three years ago. <laughs> um, so a little background on me first. Uh, I finished my PhD at Drexel in 2019. Uh, in algebraic combinatorics, symmetric, uh, specifically symmetric function theory, which is something I'll be talking about today. Um, it, it's a branch of math that hopes to solve some kind of hard algebraic geometry questions in just counting things, which, which um, makes me happy. Uh, I'm no longer associated with Drexel University. That's where I did my PhD. Uh, I currently teach high school. Uh, I kind of bailed on academia burnt out a little bit on research. Um, and now I'm very happily teaching at uh, a school in New York. And one of my students is uh, a participant in today's talk. So that's a, there's a win right there. Um, so um, kind of the theme of this talk is um, the power of like smashing different branches of math together. Um, so like one example of this is in calculus. So how do we find the perimeter of a circle? Well, we're good at polygons. Um, and we just add up all the sides. Circles, unfortunately, um, don't have sides, so I can't just add them all up. But if I take the limit of the um, polygons that we put around the circle, we can, we can figure out the, area, uh, the perimeter of a circle, right? So here's like one fruitful part of math where we kind of smush to different branches together. And this is kind of true throughout a lot of mathematics. Um, I like to do combinatorics. I'm an algebraic combinatorialist, but like that algebra part of the sentence is really, um, I don't do that. <laughs> I, I do the combinatorics. We count combinatorial objects that uh, mean something in algebra. Uh, I know what some of the algebra words mean, but I don't like, I don't chase diagrams and I don't really want to know what a category is because it scares me a little bit. Um, so let's just fix some um, definitions for today. Uh, so uh, bijection, bijection is a one-to-one -one and onto function. Uh, some basic examples we've seen uh, in our lives before. Um, I multiply everything by two, right? If I, that's a bijection from the natural numbers to the even natural numbers. Um, there's a natural bijection from C to R cross R uh, just by getting rid of the I and making the plus sign a comma. Um, and, and then there's, um, you know, for finite sets, match them up however you'd like. Uh, and I like to think of combinatorics as the study of bijection on fi bijections on finite sets. A lot of people say combinatorics is the study of counting, but if you want to think about it, just counting a set is a bijection between a set and a subset of the natural numbers. Um, so I think of combinatorics as the study of bijections because really, um, I deal with infinite sets. So we're not actually really counting. Um, algebraic combinatorics, like what kind of bijections do we care about? We care about bijections that mean something in algebra. And what kind of algebraic objects do I care about? Um, symmetric polynomials are the basic version of this. 
So a uh, symmetric polynomial in, in variables x1 through xn. Uh, it's a polynomial where if you change the role of any two variables, you get the same polynomial back. You can also think of this as a group action of Sn, um, which would just permute the variables. And each of these polynomials is invariant under all group actions uh, by permutations in Sn. So with two variables, like here's an example. If I switch the role of x1 and x2, um, it's the same polynomial, um, right, which I show here. Um, with four variables, right, um, that guy is a symmetric polynomial. With five variables, however, um, you might notice that, like, I just wrote the same polynomial down twice. But with five variables, uh, this last guy is not symmetric. And the, the reason is, is because if I change the role of x5 and x2, um, I get a different polynomial. Right, so there are, uh, we need to take into consideration all um, variables in my polynomial ring, all unknowns in my polynomial ring. Um, so the amount of variables you're considering um, can throw you for a lurch. <laughs> um, but there's ways to take care of that, but we'll get there. Uh, so the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree D and N variables. Uh, is defined by this kind of gross sum, which is iterated over a bunch of um, i's. Uh, but the best way to think about it is you add up all the ways to pick d of the xi's and you can't pick one twice, right? So if you notice in between all the i's in the subscript of that sum, it's all strict less thans, right? So that means you can't pick the same twice. So we're just adding up all ways to pick dxi without picking one twice or all monomials um, in the, uh, of, with d uh, indeterminates uh, where, where the kind of power pattern is all ones. Um, so those are the elementary symmetric polynomials. Then we have the homogeneous symmetric polynomials, which I always say homogeneous and the people make fun of me. Um, you know, it's definitions almost exactly the same. These are real nice and easy to tech up. Uh, you just got to change your less than to less than or equal to's. Uh, and it's always to pick DXI where you can pick each more than once. Um, so these are two types of symmetric polynomials. Um, so, right, I'm a combinatorialist. We like our examples. Here's our definitions. Uh, E2. Right in x1, x2, x3, that's always to pick two of the indeterminants, and I can't pick um, them twice. Right, I can't pick any one twice, so that's x1, x2, x1, x3, x2, x3. Notice if I exchange the roles of any two of these, um, we get the same polynomial. The fact that the e's and the the e's particularly are symmetric isn't. Uh, I mean, it's an easy fact to prove, but it's not. I don't think it's inherently obvious from the definition. Um, the H is maybe more so. These are both symmetric. Uh, H2, right? We got to pick two of X1, X2, and X3, uh, but I can pick something more than once. So it's E2, right? So it's X1, X2, X1, X3, X2, X3, plus the ways to pick the things twice. Uh, so those are our E's, those are our H's. Um, if I do H3, in X1 and X2, right? Now this is a little weird. Um, did I make a mistake? Hmm. It's always to pick three X1s and X2s. Uh, and I could pick, yeah, so I made a mistake there. Uh, that should be plus X1 cubed plus X2 cubed. Um, but yeah, I need to pick three of the X1s and the X2s, and I'm allowed to pick them more than once. Um, not particularly important, that example. Well, this is the important one. If I want to pick E3 of X1, X2, um, notice I'm not allowed to use two variables, more than, uh, one variable more than once. Um, so this guy is defined to be one, right? Uh, zero, excuse me. This is defined to be zero. This doesn't 
Um, we can't choose three indeterminants without choosing one twice, right? So we have another issue here. We talked about the issue before of um, the issue before here, uh, where was it? I don't remember where it was. There was another issue we talked about. Uh, we have this issue here where some of these guys aren't really well-defined. Um, a lot of them end up just being zero. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, we, we switch to something uh, from, uh, we, we use infinitely many variables. Now these are no longer polynomials. Um, we call them symmetric functions, even though we're never plugging anything in. Uh, so we're not thinking of them as a function that maps from one set to another. Uh, we call them symmetric functions when they have infinitely many variables. It's just um, a bit of terminology that's been around a while that um, we, we just held on to for some reason. Um, so you notice here, all that ch change between my definitions is that there's no less than or equal to n at the end of it, right? We have infinitely many variables. Uh, and when we have infinitely many variables, we leave off the variables. We just use ed and hd. Um, so here are some examples, right? So e2, always to pick two variables, um, h2, h3, right? So these are the same kind of idea. Uh, and you notice in e3, you're going to get some like, in each of these, you're going to get some bizarre terms. But I picked one, for example, in e3 at the bottom or one term will be x3, x43, and x12345, right? Like that has to appear in there. It's always to choose three of the infinitely many variables. So there's some families of symmetric functions in this case. Give me a second to take a peek at that. Any questions so far? I know I went kind of fast, but um, like this is kind of the more basic stuff at the beginning. Right. Um, so they're great. They're compact definitions, but they're probably difficult to work with. Like if you wanted to multiply two of these things together, that's all right. That's like some giant interlacing thing. And I don't know, that sounds terrible. Um, so how do we encode this in combinatorics is, is kind of the power of my field. Um, I'll start with a few more definition. Um, we call a partition of an integer n, a string of non-increasing positive integers whose sum is n. Uh, we write lambda is a partition of n with this weird little sideways t. And we call each of the little lambdas i part of lambda. So we know what we're talking about. So here are all the partitions of five. Um, you have to create a string which adds up to five and you can't get bigger, right? You can get smaller, you can stay the same, but you can't get bigger. So there's all the partitions of five um, and we're finite partitions. Like you can always pad with infinitely many zeros. That's not a big deal. Um, here are all the partitions of four. Uh, so we associate with each partition a Young diagram by taking the parts and drawing boxes in the i row, ensuring yeah, there's a lot of words here. It's just easier with examples. Uh, we're taking uh, what's known as the French notation. Um, so the first part of this partition is four. Uh, so we put four boxes in the first row. Uh, second part is also four. So four boxes in the second row, then three boxes, two boxes, two boxes, one box. So this is the Young diagram associated with the partition lambda. Um, it has to be up left justified. Uh, and here's the Young diagram associated with the partition mu, three boxes, three boxes, one box, one box. Um, and we're going to use these diagrams to encode our um, combinatorics. Turns out these end up being pretty useful. Uh, and here's one more example with new. I think I was just showing off my knowledge of Greek letters at this point. I'm not really sure why I needed another example. Um, okay, so uh, what is a semi-standard Young tableau? Well, we're gonna take the boxes and we're gonna put numbers in them. Uh, we want positive integers. And as when we go across the row from left to right, the integers can stay the same or get bigger. Uh, and if we go down the columns, the integers have to get bigger. 
Uh, and we call the content of a semi-standard Young tableau um, a string which counts the number of eyes in the tableau. So if we have, look at this example here, um, is this guy semi-standard? Well, you notice if you read across the rows, each row either stays the same or gets bigger. And if you read down the columns, each column gets bigger. Uh, so yes, you are semi-standard. And here's the content. The tableau has three ones, three twos, four threes, zero fours, three fives, one six, and two sevens. So there's the content of our tableau. And, and it is semi-standard. We use another example here. I'll let you guys take a peek at this. Is this semi-standard? Do the are the columns increasing and the rows non-decreasing? And you probably can see pretty quickly, yes. And the content is three ones, two twos, two threes, two fours, two fives, and a six. Um, and finally, since I'm sure you were waiting for this one for the, for the, for the, um, when we do things in threes, the third one is always a non-example, right? Um, so this guy's not a semi-standard tableau. Uh, if you look at it, there are, uh, there's one place it's not semi-standard and that's that two in the first row, right? That two comes before that one. Uh, actually there's two places. Can I, can anyone find the second place this thing is not semi-standard? Three places I see, ah, man, world's greatest example. In the first column, it's one, one, and then the second mm -hmm. column, two, two. Yeah, good, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, numbers on top of each other. Remember, you have to de uh, increase as you go down the rows. Uh, no, sad face. Um, so again, why do I care? So we're gonna use these guys to define more types of symmetric polynomials. Um, so giving a list of non-negative integers, we can define x to the a as um, just x1 to the first, uh, entry in the list, x2 to the second entry, and so on. Um, and then we can find the search, the shore function of a partition. This is the same shore that pops up all over the place. If you took an advanced linear algebra class, same shore. Uh, Isaac or Isaiah, I don't remember, one of those guys. Um, and it's just um, an element. So right here's our weird definition. Uh, S lambda is the sum over all semi-standard Young tableaus of shape lambda, um, whose content is T. But let's see an example to make a little more sense of this. Um, so S21, that means I have shape 21. And I want the variables X1, X2, X3. So we're going to restrict to finitely many variables, um, just so we have finite uh, examples. Um, so I want to fill the boxes with the numbers one, two, and three so that we have a semi-standard Young tableau. Here are the eight ways to do it, right? So these are all eight semi-standard Young tableau of shape two, one in letters one, two, and three. Um, each of these is associated with a monomial. So this first guy on the top left, x at uh, one, one, two is x one squared x two. Then we have one, one, three, that's x one squared x three. Then we have one, two, two, that's x one, x two squared. Then I got one, two, three, and one, three, two. Those are two, x one, x two, x three, and so on. Right? And uh, if you look at this polynomial we have here, um, this, this guy is symmetric. Um, it's not clear at all that sure functions need be symmetric. Um, there's one definition in terms of determinants, which gives you a really nice clean uh, proof for the sure functions being symmetric. If you do it from the tableau definition, you might want to look up something called the bender knuth involution, um, which will show that these are symmetric. Not particularly important for the talk, um, but this is symmetric. If we want to do the sure function in infinitely many variables, we just need more Tableau. Uh, we need infinitely many Tableau. Um, so it just gets messy, but we can do it. Uh, one more example, if you want S2 in X1, X2, X3, 
Um, so we got shape just two boxes in the first row. Um, here's all the tableau. There's our polynomial. Um, anyone recognize this polynomial? So we talked about it today. Think about how I'm allowed to put numbers in the boxes uh, and what, I mean, we've only talked about three types of polynomials. So what other one uh, would follow the same kinds of rules? Is it the H polynomial? It's the H's, right? It's the homogeneous ones, right? Because the homogeneous was like, I had to pick two variables for H2 uh, but I'm allowed to pick the same one twice, right? And that's what all these, these tableau are. I need to pick two numbers, but I'm allowed to pick the same one twice because they live in the first row. That's H2. S11 similarly is going to be E2, right? I need to pick two numbers, uh, except they can't be the same because they live on top of each other. So the homogeneous and the elementary guys live inside of the sure function. The sure functions are a larger class of, um, of symmetric polynomial symmetric functions. Right, so what, who cares, right? You know, we can moosh symbols around, it's really not a big deal. Um, we're gonna get to it, right? So, uh, right, in combinatorics were weird, we call numbers letters. Uh, so a word in the letters, all the letters come from the national numbers. It's a finite list of entries from the set A. Um, here's a list, here's, here's a word. We don't put commas because why? Um, here's the important thing. And here, here is kind of the main bit of the talk. Uh, there's a bijection between words and tableau, two tableau, uh, where one is semi-standard and one is known as standard. Now we haven't defined a standard young tableau yet. So we're gonna do that here. Um, there's two ways to think about a standard young tableau. I think the easiest way is it has to be semi-standard and you have to use all the numbers up to the number of boxes once, right? So say we have eight boxes, it's a semi-standard young tableau where I use each of the numbers from one to eight once. Here's an example, right? So this guy is semi-standard. Uh, but it's standard because each number is used exactly once and we use all the numbers starting at one and ending with the number of boxes, which is eight. Okay, so we can, if we take a word, we can create a semi-standard and a standard Young tableau. If I have a semi-standard and a standard Young tableau, I can recover the word. This is indeed a bijection. And it's known as the Robin, robinson shenstedt knuth algorithm, the RSK algorithm, um, making the name of this talk a risky proposition. I love bad wordplay. So um, what's the insertion algorithm? That's a lot to read. Um, I'm gonna share the slides afterwards. You can go through it um, more slowly later. Uh, so how do we insert? the word A1, A2, A3, all the way up to AN. Uh, well, it's a kind of an inductive process. We, we start by just, we create a tableau. There's one number in one box. It's the first number on our, in our word, A1. Okay, we put A1 in our tableau. Uh, after we've inserted I letters, how do we insert the uh, AI plus one? Uh, so we have some tableau. Uh, if a i plus one is bigger than every number on the first row, just put it at the end of the first row and you're done. Uh, if it's not bigger than every number on your first, first row, you find the um, leftmost entry in the row, which is greater than the thing we're trying to uh, insert, replace it with the thing we're trying to insert, pretend the first row is not there and do the same thing with the second row and continue until you're just putting something at the end of a row and stop when you've inserted everything. Again, trying to read the, the method here is kind of gross. Um, so let's just look at an example. Uh, we wanna make the word two, three, 
0.211 into a tableau. So when I insert the number two, I just put it into the tableau, there's nothing to do. Uh, and my Q tableau, my recording tableau is just recording the way the boxes are being added. So we added one box, There's there it is. Um, so now we wanna insert the number three, the second number in my word. Um, now the number three, that's bigger than every entry on the first row of my P tableau. So it just gets stuck at the end, just gets stuck at the end. Uh, and again, my recording tableau just um, records the way the boxes are being added. All right, so now I have the tableau two, three. I wanna insert the number two. Uh, well, two is not bigger than every number on row one. So what it does, I find the uh, leftmost instance of a number bigger than two, which is that three. I take the three out, I replace it with the two. Now I pretend the first row doesn't exist and I do the steps of the algorithm again. If I pretend the first row doesn't exist, there's no tableau there. So I just put a three in the second row right there. And that's the third box I created. So there's my Q tableau. All right, now what do I do with one? Well, uh, one is not bigger than every entry in row one. So it replaces the leftmost number greater than it. Now I got to do something with that two. I pretend row one's not there. All right, that two in row two has to replace the leftmost entry, which is greater than it, that three. And then I still got to put that three somewhere, but I pretend the first two rows don't exist. And I just pop it down there at the bottom. And then this two, this two, uh, well, I look, it's not, there's, it's not bigger, it's, excuse me, there's not an entry in row one, which is bigger than the two. So it just gets popped on at the end there. So this is the robinson shenstedt knuth algorithm for taking a word and making two tableau out of it. One which is uh, semi-standard and one which is um, standard. And knowing the P and the Q, you can reverse engineer this thing, right? So I know that five is the last box that was added and I can figure out how to reverse engineer it. We're not gonna do that here today. If I don't care so much about the recording tableau, uh, I can start with a tableau and insert a word. Start with a tableau and insert a, row, a word. And it's the same process. So we're gonna start by inserting that one. Uh, Inserting that one in the first row, it bumps out that two. That two in the second row, uh, in the second row is going to bump out that three, and that three is just going to go down there. After I inserted that, now I have the word one two three. Uh, that one bumps out that two, which can just go at the end of that row. That two can just go at the end, and that three can just go at the end. And I have nothing left to insert. Um, so this is just an insertion algorithm. We can take a word and smush it into a tableau. I know that was a lot. Oh, geez. Anyone have any questions about that algorithm? No? OK. Um, so. What happens? Well, I took a tableau of shape three, two, one, and I created a tableau of shape, was that five, three, two? Um, this is a way to, excuse me, a, a young diagram. I took a young diagram of shape two, three, one, made one of shape five, three, two. And notice where the boxes were added, right? They were all added kind of along the outside of the shape. And, um, in this example, none of them lay on top of each other, right? So they all are either in one row or if they're in the next row, they live on top of part of the old tableau. And this is not an accident, right? This is a, this is a important part of what's going on today. Um, if you work hard enough, you notice that you, if your word is non-decreasing, which is what we had here, we notice our word here, one, one, two, three, 
non-decreasing, the boxes in your shape never lie on top of each other. The new boxes never lie on top of each other. And this is one of the bijections that we care about. So what this is gonna do is gonna define a bijection between pairs of Tableau and non, uh, I can't read my notes. Uh, pairs of Tableau and non-decreasing words and Tableau who differ by adding boxes so that no two boxes lie on top of each other. So we have this pair, a Tableau and a non-decreasing word and it lives in bijection with a uh, new tableau where the boxes added never lie on top of each other. Um, so what is a non-decreasing word of length D? Um, well, in the kind of the new terminology we talked about today, it's a semi-standard Young tableau of shape D, right? All the boxes in the first row, D boxes in the first row. Um, so furthermore, this algorithm gives uh, a fact that the, the numbers, like the numbers never change. Our newest Tableau has the same numbers in the old two objects. Um, so hopefully we can get some kind of algebraic fact out of this. Uh, and the fact is this. Uh, if I take a sure function of shape lambda, multiply it by a sure function of shape D, where D is just a, a single row, right? Just one number. If we think about it, um, S lambda, we're summing over all the semi-standard semi Young tableau of shape lambda. SD, we're summing over all the semi-standard Young tableau of shape D. The distributive property says we're gonna have to pair all these things up in all possible ways, right? That's how the distributive property of multiplication works. It's really just a pairing. It's kind of an interlacing. Um, and we, can, we know how many of them are from this algorithm. Right, how to pair them. So let's see an example. Um, you wanna do S11 times S2. So S11 in the two variables is X1, X2. S2 in the two variables is X1 squared, X1, X2, X2 squared. Uh, if I wanna multiply these, I just need to think about it in terms of tableau, right? So um, here's the tableau version. Uh, in terms of sets, uh, if I multiply them out, right, using the distributive property, it's the same as writing them as ordered pairs in the tableau. Um, but RSK gives us a way to manage two pairs of tableau um, where the second one is just a row. Right, it can create new tableau from that. So let's go from pairs of tableau to one tableau via RSK. So this third list right here is just insertion of the one row tableau into the one column tableau, which tells us essentially that S11 times S2 is just equal to S31 because we have all tableau of shape three one in variables x1 and x2, right? So this is what RSK would tell us. There is a natural way to pair up pairs of tableau in this kind of restrictive case with um, singular tableau of a different shape. This is known as the Pieri rule. So theorem, the Pieri rule. Uh, so I wanna do S lambda times SD. It's the sum of all sure functions which are created from lambda by adding D boxes, which never lie on top of each other. Uh, another specific example here is really small because there's only two variables. This isn't all ways to do it. Um, but let, let's do this Pieri rule, for example, in, in three variables. So if I wanna do S2 times S21 times S2, I got to add two boxes to S21 so that the two boxes never lie on top of each other. Uh, the ways to do that are, are shown there. I either add them both in the first row, one in the first row, one in the second row, one in the first row, add a third row, or one in the second row and add a third row. So this is what the answer should be based on the Pieri rule. Um, and let's, let's check it. Um, so here's S21. 
which is done by just writing out all the um, tableau. Here's S2, which again, just has gotten by writing out all the tableau. Uh, and if I wanna multiply this out, there's 42 terms. Uh, I don't wanna do that. So the, uh, the trick here actually saves us a whole lot of time, right? So this combinatorial trick um, saves us a whole lot of time. And this is a lot of what the uh, study of symmetric functions uh, relies on. How can I expand products of symmetric functions into sure functions? Um, but this is how it works. So I have a problem to leave you with. Um, so if I want to do uh, S uh, lambda times ED, right? So that's the, that's the sure function where they're all written in this in one column, uh, similar methods work. Um, but I'll leave that to you to try to figure it out. Um, and this is really kind of the end of my talk, but let me give you a little uh, talk about why I guess people care about sure functions. So um, sure functions already originally came up in the study of the representation theory of the symmetric group. Um, if we want to figure out how to um, play around with uh, irreducible representations, it turns out it's easier to actually just deal with sure functions. And there's a nice correspondence between the sure functions and the irreducible representations of the symmetric group. Um, and from there, actually, a, a kind of a, a, a big study came out of it. Um, they pop up in geometry, particularly when studying the Grassmannian and the affine Grassmannian. Um, they, it's, I believe, the quantum cohomology of one of those things um, has to do with sure functions, they pop up. Then um, over in Schubert calculus, they also pop up. Um, they're kind of like a, a really, they, they, they seem to be inextric inextricably linked to like hard geometric problems. So, well, to me, this feels like doing like adult Sudoku um, like they, they really are kind of a very important uh, mathematical object that um, really has a pretty rich study to it right now. Um, so I know this was to try to get you guys into or understanding a, a, another bit of math that maybe is not taught at your school. I have no idea if it's any, any if there's anyone at Georgia doing anything like this, um, but I think it's awesome. I think you should read about it. Uh, if you want uh, references, um, you, I'll be happy to give them to you. If you have any questions, uh, shoot them my way. Otherwise, uh, thanks. Great, thank you so much. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and give a round of applause. Such a wonderful talk. Thank you. you can feel free to unmute yourself and clap or there's the uh, clap emoji in, uh, in Zoom. Uh, does anybody have any, any questions? So just to maybe to double check with this kind of last, this last theorem here. So this is giving you a way to sort of expand out that huge product of polynomials, but without ever having to do the multiplication, right? You just know Correct. it's some combination of other ones. Right, so uh, yeah, it turns out uh, that um, the ring of symmetric po uh, functions, you can think of it as a ring. Uh, you can also think of it as a vector space um, and so over Q. Right, so uh, the sure functions themselves uh, form a basis for this vector space. So um, it gives you a way to do this kind of ring. It gives you like do this ring thing, this multiplication and, and just expand in terms of the basis of a very nice natural basis of the vector space. So is it the case that if you're, you're maybe only concerned about, uh, you know, like some bounded number of these maybe you only ever want to go up to eight, could you actually write some change of basis matrix that just... Yeah, kind of yeah, so I mean, the, yeah, and, and the entries in the, in the change of basis matrix are like a lot of really cool combinatorics. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, so um, I guess we have a, a little more sophisticated audience here than the last time I gave this talk. So um, the H's and the D's and the E's themselves don't give a basis for the vector space. 
Um, but if you take products of them, uh, they give you a basis as well. Um, so like the natural basis would be like fix a monomial, right? So say you want to do uh, x1, x2 squared, right? And then you just add up all ways to do x1, x2 squared. That's like a natural, those are the monomial symmetric functions. Um, that's kind of the easiest basis, but they're like the worst to compute with. <laughs> um, so the H's and the D's, they're kind of the second easiest to compute, uh, second hardest to compute with. Uh, maybe a little easier to define than the sure functions. Um, but again, you need to take products of them to get a basis. Um, but the sure functions themselves are a basis. Um, any, I mean, any linearly independent set of which there's partition many, or that's a probably, I think you get what I mean. Um, although that's not the correct term <laughs> is, is a basis. Um, but it is an infinite dimensional vector space. So it's not, uh, not always easy to poke around with. That's really cool. So would you say this falls under this algebraic combinatorics, like strictly in that realm? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I guess this is, um, so algebraic combinatorics is people that do a lot of different stuff. A lot of it I don't understand. Um, we're, we're the symmetric function theory crew. Um, so if you want to uh, kind of learn more about this stuff, there's, um, uh, you would like Google more symmetric function theory than, than algebraic combinatorics. There's people that do like hard, algebra stuff with hop algebras and then I again I don't not my not my jam <laughs> I like to count things um uh the, I went to some talk on oh I don't even know it was like a mini course I didn't even get through a half hour of the mini course before I was completely lost on and there was algebraic combinatorics but it was just uh some guy doing hard algebra instead of instead of moving boxes around <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a small field, but it's, it's um, kind of a very active and very, um, it's a wonderful research community. That I've never met nicer people than I have in algebraic combinatorics, um, but we're, we're a smaller group. Most of us are in Philadelphia or San Diego. Um, there's a few of us that I know someone at Virginia Tech. I know someone at Virginia, um, but you know, uh, it's a good group. <laughs> Okay. Uh, any any other questions before I stop the recording here? All right, so let's, let's maybe go ahead and thank Dan uh, once more. Thank you so much. I'll, thank uh, you. Stop the recording.